season two, lifetime Grand Prix, coming back this year with a lot more fuel in my fire, I'm all in. Man, we're fired up to get this one going. This might be the biggest one. The hype is here, the energy is here. To feel it, to understand it. That's what makes this series special. It's gonna be an all out war. It has to invoke that feeling inside of you, that fight or flight. Are you gonna push or are you gonna hold back? We are all driven and we all have the same goal. We all wanna win. You gotta be on your toes from start to finish. You know, the level rises and the pressure rises, so the expectation rises. There's so much tension around this series. It's just brought out the, the toughest riders to participate in these events. I cannot anticipate what's gonna happen. I told myself I don't ever wanna see a bike again. Let's hope lightning does not strike twice. Where is my place? What am I doing? I'm not moving anymore, I'm not progressing. It's just ridiculous. We do this because it's hard. That's why it's attractive. I wanted this challenge. I wanted to push myself. I have what it takes to win. Like We line up because we want to see if we can be our best, but be the best. This is it. Who will it be? He wants to win this race. I'm not here for top five. I'm here for more than that. I'm here because I want to be. I don't like to race for second, so. I'll just give it everything. If you crack, you crack. If not, then you're going to be in the race. You're going to ride hard all day, and we'll settle this in the end. Ah, it's going to be the victor. An unbelievable battle. It's got nothing but daylight. It's a gravel race. This ain't road racing. Game on. Last season was interesting because I kind of had some setbacks early on in the year. Like I had a crash with surgery and I had a bad case of COVID. So I really wasn't performing to where I wanted to be until the end of the year. And like, I think that showed at Big Sugar when I finally had everything come together and ended up winning. This is your winner, Kate Otto! The article came out that I was the dark horse and you know, it's like, I knew I could win that race. Like the goal was to win. Like I wasn't there to get top 10. Like I was there to win and I rode as if I wanted to win. I was like, I might implode at any moment, but no, I just kept going and yeah, I felt good. So it feels really, really good. People may underestimate my skill level, but like, here's the thing, like I'm only going to get better because my skills are going to improve. And I don't know if people recognize that. The ones that do, like they should be afraid. <laughs> Last year, coming into the Lifetime Grand Prix Series, I was definitely unknown. I was juggling a job in the ER. I'd fly home, go work in the ER, and then go to a bike race. I want to prove to myself and to people in the past what I'm capable of and that I am good. At this level, sometimes there's a pecking order of who should be where. And in the past, like maybe people didn't know who I was and say like, why is she trying to get in the line here? She doesn't belong. But the reality is, is like, if I'm there, then I'm there. And if you're uncomfortable with that, that's your problem. Hopefully that inspires other people to say like, let's go f up some results and like prove ourselves and just inspire other people to say like, you don't have to fit this mold of a professional cyclist that's been riding bikes since you're 10 and your parents rode bikes and you've been traveling the country and internationally. It's like, we are all driven. We all have the same goal. We all want to win. Sarah Sturm. Sarah Sturm.
And Becca will help you from okay. here on Thanks. out. Okay, <laughs> Here we are at Sea Otter, race number one of season two of the call of a lifetime. He's gonna take two photos, one with your bike and then one by yourself. It's gonna be pretty straight. So natural. Oh yeah, it's pretty nice. I feel like really normal in there. <laughs> uh, it's, it's gonna, when you what do I do with my hands? I think we're gonna go for you standing on the box. Because I'm so short. Mm, no, it won't work because you'll still be out of frame. So never mind, that won't work. We've got the, the Fuego XC this weekend. Talking to some of the athletes, nerves are high right now. You know, you can feel it. That was great right there. Lifetime season two, I'm excited for it. We have a lot of new faces. It's gonna be fun. Season one was awesome, but season two, I think it's gonna shake things up a bit. It'll be, it'll be a cool challenge. I didn't have one of these last year. Hold up, set high. Little high. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna do one of these. Snap. Game on. My name's Kimo Seymour. I'm uh, glad to be back for season two of Call of a Lifetime. Excited to kick off the 2023 season of the Lifetime Grand Prix. This last season, we saw a lot of dynamics that we never could have predicted. My schedule has been insane. It felt very intentional. No, it was no one wants to be behind the roadies. Yeah, in the front. The oh, oh, big crash. Uh, we really didn't know what we were getting ourselves into. Everyone's had bad luck. Other than Keegan, there's so much tension around this series. The Grand Prix was everything I was hoping to find. That was one of the coolest seasons of bike racing for me that I've had in a long time. Leaders of the 200 now coming in for it a It was final kind start. of a different thing to get used to, I think for all of us. Nobody knew what to expect and every single event was a learning experience. I got a taste of it and I wanted to give it a go again. This racing right now is the highest level racing you can do in North America. All the best riders are here. I never even questioned coming back. I don't have a sling on or a hand brace, which is awesome. There's a little bit of unfinished business. The biggest changes we've made, we decided to add one more event. Well, we've also thrown in a little uh, gravel race we have in Southern Colorado called Rad, down in Trinidad, Colorado. Having seven races instead of six this year, is gonna be a big change in my opinion because it allows you to play tactics. You know, we should give the athletes the opportunity to drop a second race because we saw last season, you know, you have one bad mishap, you might be out for a race or two. It really plays out more for who's stronger and who's fitter, just in case those mechanicals happen. This year, I think many of us have the opportunity to apply learnings from last year. I think it will really come down to the last event. While cycling is on the map around the world, actually, the United States has been largely responsible for the growth of different disciplines of mountain biking. It was very exciting to see an uptick in international rider applications this year over the previous year. And what that tells us is that what we're doing and what's happening with cycling in North America resonated. I'm Danny Shrewsbury and I'm from London in the United Kingdom. Before I came out here, I was like, I don't know, I feel like I need a bucket hat to fit in the vibes. And then my friends were like, you're crazy. But I bought it and people are loving it. So I'm rolling with it. <laughs> This year's definitely more stacked. I think having more international talent here just legitimizes what we're doing. I'm Brendan Johnston from Canberra, Australia. My name is Connie Loser, coming from Switzerland. This is Matt Beers from South Africa. There's more competitive women. I think we will see a more dynamic leaderboard this year. You've got Emma Grant, Sarah Sturm, Ruth Winder all in that front group. I definitely felt the FOMO at the races, racing them and not being part of the Grand Prix. The gravel here is the strongest in the world. That's why people come, that's why people want to be in the Grand Prix, and um, yeah, that's for sure why I want to be in the Grand Prix. The biggest question I want to know is, where is my place, you know? I know my place in Australia, but I don't know my place here. I like the, the challenge. I think that's why a lot of guys also want to compete in North America. I've started getting into gravel riding a lot more. I became gravel national champion in the UK last year, so. I think that helped my profile maybe a little bit, and I whacked that on, and here I am. <laughs> like the UK scene's just getting to know gravel, but I knew that it was so much bigger in America. So I was looking at like doing Unbound, um, Big Sugar, and then someone was like, you should apply. So I did apply, and then I kind of forgot about it, and I was like, hmm, not sure if I'll get in. 
and then uh, got, got the email come through and I was like, no, I'm doing it. And here I am, so it's pretty cool. Hey, how are you? I'm Danny. Danny, nice to meet you. I relate to Emily. I haven't done much mountain bike background and I know she was in a similar position this time last year. My apprehension for this series is definitely the mountain bike, for sure. I just have very limited experience in it. I need to get on the bike and do my best, accept where I am weak, but also understand that I have strengths that I'm taking from my road background that perhaps a mountain biker doesn't have. I was following your journey last year and I feel so relatable because I was, I'm a road rider uh -huh. and don't do much mountain biking. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, this is gonna be like so challenging for me. Yeah. Like, oh God, I've suddenly like realized what am I doing? But then I remembered like, I wanted this challenge. I wanted to push myself. Like last year, I just had no idea what to expect. And it was a lot more fun than yeah. I expected. I really? Yeah, so I think you're gonna love it. Yeah. I know that I just got to get through, through today. And then at least I know the next few events coming up are more my territory and I can really show everyone what I can do. And your name? Danny. Danny. Yeah. Do you want a waffle? Yeah. Mmm. <laughs> oh yeah. Can we take them in our pocket tomorrow when we race? We're here at the Salty Seal Brew Pub um, on Cannery Row in downtown Monterey. I basically made a film with a handful of my sponsors in Tasmania, and we're doing a screening tonight. It's the kind of pre-release party. Thank you all so much for coming, and. Uh, Let's do the little movie. Monterey is a pretty famous little town in and of itself. It's just a really neat backdrop for the first round of the Grand Prix. We do more than produce events, we're community builders, and our goal with the events that we have is to benefit the communities. Monterey is it's kind of the bucket list destination. Of the ocean and the aquatic lifestyle. Uh, something like 80 to 90 percent of lettuce and strawberries and asparagus and cauliflower we consume in the country is grown here in the greater Salinas Valley. There's amazing riding here. Road riding, gravel riding, trail riding, all sorts of riding. The Outer Classic 2023 and first day shows open. I mean, this is like kickoff of the season. So first year here. 93 was my first year. He's racing on Sunday. We're having a blast. Bustling, a lot of people out. Everyone's doing stuff, it's great. The bike community, no matter what kind of bike you ride, everyone's just really excited because those two wheels bring kind of everyone together. The madness is beginning. Like 100,000 people here between all the racing and the expo. Everybody happy, everybody laughing. We just giggled. This event is crazy. It's get weird. <laughs> We're in Seattle class. Perfect. Can you meet me at your truck at turn five? And I want to show you something on the map that happened. We rerouted around 47 on the first lap and around this area because there was some tremendous uh, water over the winter. There are some really rutted sections because of the water on trail 95 that they'll be descending. Had to reroute around some of these, you'll see this pond. Well, these ponds expanded with the winter rain. It is amazing how powerful mother nature is. The so-called atmospheric river threatens to worsen damage in areas where recent storms have already dumped several feet of snow. The amount of water impacted course conditions phenomenally. Last year, it was dusty and slippery. Talked about the sandy, dusty turns are gonna prove difficult for many of the riders as they come flying in here. Now it's a little bit more hard packed and the surface is in some ways better, but yet there are big rutted areas. I think because of all the ruts now in the trails, I'm going to leave a little extra space from the person in front of me. You just want to be able to see what's in front of you. And it'll be interesting too because there are some sections where 
you go downhill really fast and drafting is important, so you also don't want to lose contact. In the past, we haven't gone so much over here. We've stayed on this side, so we really have an opportunity to use the entire portion of Fort Ord. We're really excited about this year. We were able to engage a larger footprint than we were previously. It is really three or four different sections. The beginning part is more open, gravel roady. The second portion of the course is short, steep, punchy, twisty, single track descents. The rut's forming in the center of most of the descent. At high speed and you're following someone or two or three other people, it's more of a challenge. And then all of a sudden you pop out and you're back on gravel roads. This is my first ever mountain bike race. Just trying to like get comfortable with keeping speed flowing in and out of corners. And then the finish. You're in single track and then all of a sudden you hit a steep climb home. It's double track, but it's rutted. You can't just power and keep your head down. You're gonna have to look, pick a line and make your way up the hill. That is where I think the race will be decided. Dude, it is so fast out there. It is, it's gonna be fun. Sweet. Yeah, it's gonna be good. Killer. Uh, okay, so what's the, we need a plan for the race tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> Who, who's the guy feeding for Canyon down low? So right now it's Zach, but- By uh, himself? That's, that's what we're trying to figure out. Okay. Uh, yeah. I think we're ready. Round two is Sea Otter. Same spot as last year. Let's hope lightning does not strike twice. Uh, that's the corner. Um, kind of sent the rest of my season into turmoil. And this year we, instead of taking this corner, we keep going up, 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 all the way to the very tippy top. So that's a lot more time to spread out, get rid of a lot of the fluff. Um, and then you'll actually see us coming down that single track right there. And then you see all that serpentine stuff in the hill out there. And so we'll be coming down that, we all within the first 20 minutes. So uh, Diane and the kids can just sit here and watch in the morning and hopefully see dad in a better position than last year. Now it's bedtime. We've had a big day. Last year was kind of all new. And yeah, now we know the flow of things. So it'll be, It'll be interesting to see how that plays into the whole experience uh, and performances, I guess. Yeah. I like to be organized, but not like stressing too much about it. Sometimes I do some writing about what's going on in the race. Sometimes I like study roots like a little more closely. If it's... You're super analytical about your nutrition and the course profile and that kind of stuff. Like you make, you make plans and you do calculations about that kind of thing. Yeah, but in a chill way. Sure, in a chill way. Yeah, you don't want to come across too serious. No. He's super chill, guys. Yeah, <laughs> super chill. I just kind of like write out some mantras and some process goals and um, it's, it's almost like a diary, I suppose, but just kind of like some notes to get me on the right, on the right uh, page mentally and emotionally too. Basically, that first two minutes of the race needs to be like eyeballs bleeding hard so that you can get into that single track with as little traffic in front of you as possible um, and then have clear run of it. Um, like one of my goals is to be like top three into the first dirt section so that you have freedom of movement and reaction capabilities. You kind of feel stressed until the last, until you cross the finish line. Like really, it doesn't really go away until it's over. All right, Seattle, we are ready to kick off stop number one of the 2023 Lifetime Sea Otter Classic presented by Continental on the first event of the Lifetime Grand Prix presented by Mazda. We're so excited to kick things off here. This is a deep 
deal. You know, we have world champions, national champions, so these riders better be warmed up and ready to go. Oh, you're my favorite female rider. Oh, Tommy Vaughn. <laughs> How you feeling? Oh, so nervous. So good. All right, riders, we are roughly 90 seconds away from the start. 65 miles on tap, that's two laps around this course, lots of elevation. So we're going to give you a countdown once we hit five seconds to go, and that is now five, four, three, two, one. They are off round number one of the Lifetime Grand Prix presented by Mazda. All riders are off and running. Who is going to be the victor out here on the course today? It's not going to be slow off the start. It's going to be full gas and it's just going to be hang on. You know, this starts such a crucial part to this race. The first single track section is going to blow the field apart. So fighting to be ahead of the gaps that form is going to be important. We'll see these riders burning a lot of matches. It's going to be an all out war right to the top. Maybe an all out two minute sprint from the start line to get good position into the single track. People jockeying for position to get to that single track first. Almost like a cyclocross start. Very, very aggressive and fast off the line. I think the competition is is way stiffer this year. The That front pack is tighter. That front group is going to stay together longer into the day. First three riders into the dirt are Christopher Blevins, Keegan Swenson, and Russell Fitzgerald. They are obviously some of the strongest riders out there, so this is no surprise. All right, we are now ready to start our call-ups for our elite women's field of lifetime Grand Prix athletes. I think race starts are pretty challenging to get them perfect. 30 seconds to go. To get your foot in the pedal where you want it to be shifting just when the gun goes off. Go! You get nervous and things happen. <laughs> All right, riders, our women's field is off and running. Stop number one of the 2023 Lifetime Grand Prix. If I'm looking at Sophia or Alexis, then I'm probably in the pointy end of things. Just like in our elite men's field, you can see everyone out of the saddle trying to get to the head of affairs as quickly as they can. We see Hannah Otto, Sophia, Haley, and Alexis Scarda, and we will have to see how that thins out as they head into single track. Yeah, I'm excited to see how things unfold. We're going to have lots of information for you throughout the day. The Lifetime Grand Prix presented by Mazda is officially underway. All right, looks like we've got our leaders through the first of our time splits out on the course. We've got a little bit of a front group going on. Russ Finsterwald, the winner of Belgian Waffle Ride last week. He's the first rider through that time check. Andrew Lesprance, one of our Canadian friends, running through in the second spot. Keegan Swenson, Howard Grotz, Cole Pat, and Chris Blevins all together in that front group right now. I expected it to kind of narrow down to an elite group of riders at the pointy end of this race. Those are all the heavy hitters. I think athletes who have done these events for a few years um, certainly have an advantage. We've got a big second group, about a minute or so behind. So they're gonna know who's, who's strong where and what their strengths and weaknesses are against each of the competitors. That's Connie Loser, the Swiss rider, Jasper Aklan, Brendan Johnston, also in that group. Which perhaps is an advantage for me. I can kind of fly under the radar a bit. I think having raced the series all the way through one year is definitely an advantage. It's just knowing how to manage training. You're familiar with the terrain of the course and your bike setup. Second time around is always smoother. It's basically you had a year to recon the Grand Prix, right? We're talking a lot about riders getting off to a really good start out here. You know, this series is seven races. So you've got seven chances out here to, to kind of boost your overall standing. It's a long season, so I'm really interested to see how it plays out. Uh, having the experience of these races and knowing what an eight-month season feels like uh, is really valuable. We've got our top 15 women right now through the first time check. 
got Hannah Otto, Alexis Carta, Sophia Gomez, Via Fon, Vera Lucer, Evelyn Dongle, Aaron Hawk, Jenna Reinhardt. It's like as much as I want to come to the season new and fresh and as a beginner, the place that you exist in is informed by what you've been through. Just a little bit behind Sarah Sturm and Haley Smith rounding out your top ten. Last year was formative for me in this discipline. And no matter how much I choose not to buy into pressure, there is a storyline of the defending champion. We have some firepower in that chasing group, and it's not that far behind. Our elite men are closing in on the completion of lap number one. So make your way on over to the boards here and cheer on our riders as they come through to complete lap number one in just a couple of minutes. Here they come making that last sweeping downhill turn onto the dirt. And indeed, we have, looks like about seven riders in that group. Who's leading the charge right now? Yeah, we got Lesby, Andrew Lesperance leading the charge with Keegan on his wheel. Christopher Blevins following close. We got Alex Wild, Howard Groth. So world-class riders up front. Well, right now they are on the pavement. They are just about to complete lap number one. I'll tell you, everybody's still sharing the workload. Nobody really willing to kind of make a statement just yet. Just right off the bat, you had Payson and Alexi straight to the back. We just saw Rob Britton come down the hill walking his bike, so we know he's out for the day. Um, so some disappointments on the men's side for sure, but it's a long race. So Alexi and Payson and Cole, those faces we expected to see up there, they, there's still time for them. Um, there's a couple sections that they're going to be really well suited for, and hopefully they can make up some ground. Things are really start going to start to go down on this second lap. Last year, it really came down to that last climb home. Keegan Swenson attacked. He's got a 15 second gap over Russell Finsterwald, going away by himself. Our top three have completely blown apart. And if Keegan comes out and wins, that's this feeling toward everybody okay? Are we doing the same thing again? Is this deja vu? I think that's kind of cool. Like it's pressure on Keegan, it's pressure on all of us to make it not happen. Two hours and 45 minutes of racing for our elite men. Still the same seven riders. You know, last year I just raced every race as if it was its own. God, if I can just win every race, then it's easy. Nothing's happened in that front group. At what point are we gonna see our elite men start to take some stabs and attacks? I look at that lead group and Blevins has won major races, Keegan has won this whole series, and then I look at Russell Fitzgerald, Fizdy, and Cole Patton, they're going to just follow the attack, they're not going to make the attack. I raced Fizdy last weekend in the gravel race and he was really strong, obviously, and I feel like guys like him, surely he's frustrated with what went on last year and Keegan kind of telling everyone up. Russell Finsterwald and Keegan Swenson are like best buds, but mountain biking is an individual sport. I know they're friends, but I'm sure that's frustrating to be, yeah, getting smoked by Keegan at most of the races. Our lead group of seven is now lead group of four. Blevins, Finsterwald, Swenson, and Cole have managed to separate themselves and the rest of those riders scattered out behind. I thought we had Cole put away a few times today. So Russell would attack, or I'd attack, or Chris would put in a dig, and that like, Cole would come off, and you're like, all right, we got him this time. You know, and then you look back, and you're like, damn, he's back. Like, you just couldn't get rid of him today. Keegan is starting to turn the screws, turning the pace up slowly. And that's what makes this series special. It has to invoke that feeling inside of you, that fight or flight. Are you going to push, or are you going to hold back? Those men are going to be attacking full gas on that last climb home. That's where all the action is going to go down. The word on the street right now is our lead women are just a couple of moments away. They're inside the venue to complete lap number one. All right, we've got our leaders in sight. Our women leaders are now just across from the start finish line on the home straight. We've got Alexis Scarta, Sophia Gomez, Hannah Otto, Vera Loser, and it looks like they've been joined by another rider.
Aaron Huck was able to close that gap, I'm guessing, on that long climb home. Well, we've got our two chasers into sight just across from us. Sarah Sturm with her game face absolutely on. Evelyn Dong rolling through. We still have about two and a half hours left of racing, so anything can happen. You know, some of these gaps that can seem insurmountable are surmountable. And I say that to Haley Smith, who rolls through now. <laughs> <laughs> I think most people in the film crew, in Lifetime, the whole organization didn't really expect anything from me last year. She's by herself. What are the odds she's going to get back on terms right now? But. I was the only person in the field who had a World Cup off-road podium. I was the only person who has like an international games medal that I know of. I was an Olympian and at one point I was ranked third in the world on the UCI ranking, but I completely flew under everyone's radar and I wasn't interviewed until the fourth round when I'd already been in second place for most of the season. She knows that, you know, fireworks can start to happen in a race that's this long start to blow up. I think that because other people undersold me, I undersold myself. The women should be closing in on 44 mile time split. When did the fireworks start in that lead group? The pull for racing is getting the chance to race against the best in the world. Like we line up because we want to see if we can be our best, but be the best. I talked to Sarah Sturm yesterday and she, I said, what's your favorite part about the Lifetime Grand Prix? And she goes, how deep and talented this women's field is. Every single woman out there is strong. It's just a matter of who executes on the day. The closer we get to the finish, there's more victims of some of that pace making at the front. So we are now down to three leaders. Vera Loser, Sofia Gomez, Via Fon, and Alexis Scarta. Those three riders at the head of affairs right now. I want to constantly line up against people who make me the best athlete that I can be. Maybe the biggest news is Hannah Otto has fallen back and she is now 14 minutes behind the lead groups. To me, that sounds like a mechanical problem. I mean, last year a different woman won every single race in the series. It's important to note that we have a small chase group that's close behind, Aaron Huck and Haley Smith. And I'll tell you, I would not want those two ladies chasing me in the lead group. I know that there's going to be a group of us together, and it's going to come down to that last climb. So I think trying to pay attention to who's going to make that move, make that attack, and just try to be aware and stay on it is going to be huge. Once again, the situation on the elite men's side, Blevins, Finsterwald, Swenson, and Cole Patton, they're really into the closing moments of this race right now. I changed my training quite a bit this off season. I spent three months in Spain. I was just spending way more hours on the bike. We call it high volume. Cole Patton is kind of the name that really stands out to me. Cole's been steadily improving year after year. This is his step out season. That's my prediction. I just needed that to tune my diesel engine, to make sure I have that power at the end of those long races. He's got a lot of podium appearances. He's a very, very good rider, not one of the more experienced riders up there. Getting on the podium, it's not really something that we would be surprised with, with a rider like Cole Patton. Potentially winning the race, uh, that could be a little bit of a surprise from a rider like Cole. The Elite Men's Pack is on the bottom of Lookout, so this is where it happens. This is what it comes down to. And there they go, Keegan out front and Russell just behind, everyone out of the saddle giving as much as they got. They have been pushing the pace the entire race, and we'll see if anyone has anything left. Keegan and Russell have separated themselves, Blevins is just barely hanging on, and Cole's been dropped. It's just Russ Finsterwald and Keegan Swenson. We are now down to two in the front. So this group is just dwindling and dwindling. Blevins and Cole Patton are chasing. 
Keegan is continuing to press. He's just going, going, going. And, but Russell's not going anywhere. He is staying, hanging on his wheel as they crest the climb. It is Swenson. It is Finsterwald. These two guys, they train together. They travel together. They know each other. Hours in the saddle. As they come towards the finish, this is going to get tactical. Oh, this is what we all live for in every event. Russell is attacking right now, but Keegan matches. It looks like it's going to come down to a final sprint. After months and months of training, it all comes down to this final moment. And honestly, everyone's tired. Everyone has no matches left. So I think, in my opinion, it really comes down to who wants it more. Oh, we're starting to get a little bit of noise coming out of that turn, and just like that, here is our two leaders, Sea Otter. Make some noise, we've got a big finish coming down the stretch. Keegan Swenson, I don't think Finsterwald's got any reply to that. He's out of the saddle. Folks, this is gonna be all Keegan Swenson. Give it up for your men's winner. Russ Finsterwald with a fine effort coming through in second place. What a fine ride by these two riders. The last person I wanted to bring to the line. Well, second to last, but well, it's a hard race. It was just wide open from the start, man. Like, never eased up, really. I've been second to Keegan a lot. You got to yeah, really want to win this year. That's just like that's my main objective. Is to win more. How does it feel to win this first stop, um, coming back as the defending champion? You know, it's a good way to start off the series. You know, start off with the lead and kind of takes the pressure off the next few races. <laughs> Congratulations, Keegan. We look forward to cheering you on and the rest of them. Once again, lots of finishers trickling in. With every finisher, with every tick of the clock, we're getting a little bit closer to our elite women's field. Still have our three leaders, Sofia Gomez, Villafane out there, Alexis Scarda, and Vera Loser. Those three are leading. They're followed closely between Haley Smith, Aaron Hop, Nara Sturm, and Jenna Reinhardt. Fatigue setting in, cramps. You won't see an explosive attack, but you will see a ramp up in pace on this final climb. The women are at the bottom of lookout. This is where you win the race. This is where you make a separation. It looks like Haley Smith has bridged up to the lead group, and now she's going to be climbing with the leaders. What a comeback for Haley Smith. Things have exploded on that last climb. Sophia has made her move and she has a growing gap. So final attacks are going down on that final climb. Let's see if she can hold this advantage to the finish line. And here she comes, Sophia gomez Vishpane. She has held that gap from her attack on the climb. She has a mile right now. There is no one else in sight. She is the only rider in the pictures, the champion of stop number one. This is Sofia Gomez Villafane. I dug in pretty deep today to get the win. And um, you know, I'm lucky number 13, and you know, it, it turns out it wasn't not so unlucky for me. Yeah, this is a great start to the series. Did you flip that number plate upside down? Yeah, that's what you do when you have lucky number 13. So Alexis started for second place. Looks like we've got our third place rider. Haley Smith has ridden herself back into this race for fourth place. I'm asking myself if I can do it. If I, if last year was a fluke, like most of what I ask myself is doubt. Just not ideal to miss that front. It was a big mistake. So it's a shame, but um, still pretty good points. I think maybe six, five or six in the Grand Prix. So, oh, first mountain bike ride in a while. 
But all in all, I mean, a joy of a course to rip and I got both my wrists intact and I think I got a few more points than the start of last season, so it's all good, man. I don't know, it kind of went wrong from the start. I think I got complacent sitting on the start line, you get a call up and I kind of didn't battle up, up the first hill. I mean, I, I would hope this is one of my worst results of the year and um, yeah, it's not, it's not how you win the Grand Prix. I mean, I think you should be happy. Yeah. Sure. It's good. I'm happy, man. I felt like I had, I was so consistent, but I couldn't follow any attacks. But, oh man, you did the right thing. Thanks, bro. Wow, well, I'm glad God. to be done. <laughs> yeah, Kaylee's just got a glittery king nowhere. I'm so sorry, Han. Ugh, I'm bummed. I went through six CO2s. Oh, I'm so, I was thinking yeah, about you. Like, like... I really felt like it was my day to take the win. Hit a rock, heard my rim hit, flatted. I put a tube in, I went through six CO2s, I had to stop three times. It happens. I think last year there was a big learning curve for me about surrendering control. I cannot anticipate what's gonna happen. There are surprises that will both elate me and disappoint me. Yeah, like you can tell when he was, he was hurting. I like, he almost could have gone away. Yeah, but he's too strong and he doesn't quit. Yeah, I man, I definitely learned a lot last year. You know, that was like me first time racing Unbound, first time doing some of these other gravel races, and gravel in the U.S. is a different beast. Like, it's kind of its own thing. It's like the wild west of bike racing, right? So it's, it's just different and new. So I think it'll be exciting to see kind of how it shakes out. Next stop is Unbound, 200 miles, a very different event. Will it be Russell Finsterwald's turn to take that top spot away from Keegan? Also, Sophia showing early dominance in this series. And will she continue that dominance where she won last year at Unbound?